I'm Teresa Wilhelmson. I'm the Utah State Engineer and the Director of the Division of Water Rights, and I see quite a few familiar faces here. Um, let me also indicate, so we are live streaming the meeting and it will be recorded. And so we, we do have Frank sitting over here, um, just so that you know it's being recorded um, and is live streamed. We will post a link to the meeting on our website as well, so that folks can refer back um, to that. So um, let me, I think most people are making their way in here now and we're pu pulling out some chairs. But let me just also introduce some of the staff that we have here today. So most of you may know Will Atkin. He is our regional engineer out of our Logan office and he's just sitting up here on the um, stage with me. And then next to Will is Blake Bingham and he is my deputy director or deputy state engineer. And then we also have Eric Jones just right here. He is our Applications and Records Assistant State Engineer. You may have ran into him in hearings. He's actually also our Division Hearing Officer. And then I have to give a shout out to our wonderful Logan Office folks that you may have dealt with, um, and they're standing back there against the wall. Um, Shelly, Skyler, and Ted. And then um, a shout out to Jake, who is here as well, and he's with the Division of Water Resources, so um, joining us. So we're going to, what we wanted to do today is talk about um, where we are in the water right policy, what the current water right policy is, some of the challenges that we're facing, and then we really wanted to hear from the community and the public to help us make um, good decisions moving forward with water right policy. Um, Will is gonna cover what we have um, currently have and also the proclamation that was issued by the governor and what that does. And then we wanna talk about feed and get feedback from all of you in the community and what you're seeing, what's working, what challenges you're facing, um, because we may need to come forward with a water right policy to um, close the basin, um, even to small domestic applications. But we want to talk about that and get your feedback and see what you're seeing as a community. So with that, I am going to turn the time over to Will, and he's going to present to you and we will be around for a while to answer questions. And we do have a mic over here for the public comment. We can pass that around if that's easier, especially for the folks in the center. But we do want you to, if you have a question, to talk into the mic so that the folks online can hear you. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Will. Thank you. I just got a few slides here that I'd like to go through as we talk about our our policy, our water rights policy. That's what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, as as Teresa indicated, uh, we're going to talk about our current policy within Area 29. Area 29 is the Bear River Basin in Box Elder County. Um, We'll talk about the governor's proclamation, some proposed policy changes and what next steps there are. And then we'll, we'll hear comments and questions. Um, currently the policy in area 29, and this goes back a lot of years, um, that uh, for our appropriation policy for both surface and groundwater, um, as in most of the state, no filings are approved in canyon areas above fully appropriated springs and streams. Manaway Valley is closed and has been closed to new appropriations. The Bothwell Pocket is an area that we've experienced uh, groundwater problems. And so it has been limited to uh, single family domestic filings as is White's Valley that is tributary to it. Uh, the Thatcher area, the valley east of Willard Bay, and the east side of the valley have had uh, issues that we have dealt with, and so those are areas of concern. Um, 
changes uh, from surface to gr underground is an issue. And, and so this, that's been the policy for a number of years. Uh, more recently, um, in 2018, we came uh, to a similar meeting. It wasn't quite as well attended, but um, as we introduced a groundwater policy for what we call the Malad and Bear River drainages uh, in Area 29, it was the result of uh, and supported by a uh, groundwater study that was uh, paid for and uh, by the division and 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 co with cooperative funding and uh, was conducted by the USGS. Uh, based on that report and and comments and and all things considered, uh, we left the valley open to appropriation of groundwater. Um, considering each application on its own merits, we allowed for uh, 10,000 acre feet of potential groundwater development and uh, and said that we would continue to monitor the hydrologic system. Um, <clears throat> it didn't supersede the previously mentioned um, administration policy practices and localized interference concerns that that uh, we were aware of. Um, we had particularly had concerns in the Plymouth area and the Deweyville area. On uh, November 3rd, the governor issued a, a proclamation temporary, temporarily closing the Great Salt Lake Basin and its tributaries to new appropriations, which includes the Bear River Basin uh, and, and the Malad River Basin also. Uh, the governor's proclamation had had notable exceptions for applications for non-consumptive uses, um, also applications that include a mitigation plan to offset depletion, also exempted applications for small amounts of water as defined in the code uh, that comply with uh, state engineer policies. Um, Tonight, we're here to hear your comments on a proposed new policy change um, that further restricts appropriations in Area 29. We're proposing that the area be closed to new consumptive applications to appropriate of any size, including small amounts of water that fail to include a mitigation plan that offsets depletions. I know this is a big change for this area, um, the next steps in, in our process is that we will receive and evaluate public comment. Uh, we're here to, to hear your concerns regarding this policy and, and water rights appropriation policy for this area. We'll refine it as needed and, and we, there will be an, a period of time where we'll be open to, to comments uh, the conclusion of which is that we'll come back with a proposed policy, a written policy, and there will be uh, a date of adoption and so forth as we implement it. Uh, my final slide here is, oops, is, and all this is going to be, is or is going to be online. There's a, you can send written comments to our Salt Lake office. You can also submit them online at our website, waterrights.utah.gov. Um, and so with that, are there any questions or comments for questions for clarification of the policy? Let me um, just really quickly say, so we're thinking we need to close the basin to the to all new appropriations, but that's what we're here to, to determine what your feedback is. Um, that decision has not been made. Um, we're just looking at that maybe the direction we need to go. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, but questions? Just so Matt, Joel, oh. back to Byron, 29, did you have a slide that showed that? Sorry, okay. it, we're, we're, we are recording, so if you'll just stand and say your name. I wasn't ready to call me, and I was just wanting to, he said, ask for clarification on, yeah, area 29. Did you got drawn on the map there? 
Tebow Battles. What portion of Box Hunter County is Area 29? Where does Lords and Lion go? Okay, Area 29, I don't know if it's in. Uh, oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to use my laser. What's in the Area green? 29 is, is the Bear River Basin. So it's basically um, from the county line with Cache County uh, west to uh, Thatcher Mountain. And so that natural divide, uh, topographic divide between uh, uh, the Blue Creek Valley is in Area 13, so Area 29. Is is everything you see in green there, plus um, the Thatcher area? So this is the policy map that was in place under the Malad Valley policy, but this also includes um, areas that weren't in the Malad policy. Any other questions for clarification? Yeah, my name's Brody Calder. I just wanted to know uh, what you're looking for in the mitigation plan. Like what kind of rights, what are you looking for so that we can offset that? That's a good question. Submit a medication plan and we'll tell you if it's good. I don't know. I don't know what, how to answer that question. Um, Say, so I think that um, part of some of the information that we would because that's a, gr a great question. What would a mitigation look like? Um, could you acquire shares of stock that could get committed to offset those depletions? Um, what could you do um, in this area? So those are also comments that we're looking for as well. Is that even an option um, based on what you know in the Valley? So we don't have that answer. It's going to be tailored to case by case situation. So I think that's some of the reluctance about saying this is what a mitigation plan looks like because it's going to be highly dependent on the application. Any other, Carl? Carl Mackley with the Bear River Water Conservancy District. Um, can you give us any reasoning as to why the drastic change in policy? Because this is quite a dramatic shift in policy and we haven't seen any studies or, or anything backing this, this proposal. Um, why? Why, why, is, why are you changing the policy? Um, and, and that also goes against the existing policy that you spend a lot of money, time to develop, I, th I think some justification would be warranted. Yeah. Um, so I think all of us realize um, the hydrology that has been happening, um, the demands and the effects that um, withdrawals are having in the various areas. When we look at how many pending applications pending approved applications are out there, um, what impact could those have? And so as we're looking at, do we need to adjust the policy more on a long-term basis? We're also looking at how many already filed applications are unapproved that are sitting out there. And I think we're, I, I can't remember the number um, of acre feet, but it's pretty large. And how many of these approved applications that we have that when they're developed, what effects our existing rights going to have. Um, we believe that existing rights will be unaffected, but we've got to get some of these developed and see what the effects are. Um, so I think it's just a, a matter of the deck kind of stacking. Um, what is what's happening with the hydrology and what do we have um, moving forward in the next um, five to 10 years? So we're looking at it. Let me add Maybe some. Maybe I'll add one other thing. Go ahead. I think the other other thing just to add, um, we do a lot of work around the state. And one of the biggest things that um, really impacts basins 
is over appropriation or paper water, the amount of paper water that's approved. Um, and in my mind, can we not go that far here? Um, you know, is there something that we can do so that we don't get to the point that we are in some other basins that is very, very difficult for us and for me as state engineer to cut folks off? Um, shut them off because we've over appropriated and they've exceeded safe field. I'm talking groundwater basins. Um, but at what point can we be wise enough that we don't get that far up here? So I'll turn it. Will had more to add. So the other thing I'd comment on is is um, some of you in this this audience know that we have I have met with uh, some of the local entities here the Tree Mountain, a Brigham Tree Mountain Realty Board or something like that. Um, I've been in panel discussions. I've heard from the county. I've heard from 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 uh, water companies included that the current policy where was allowing for multiple unit subdivisions to go in on single family domestic wells. And so I, I heard from from what I was hearing, that that wasn't necessarily a desirable thing for this valley is to have all these single family domestic wells. And so I think that plays into part of an answer to your question. Does that make sense? Yeah, can I ask a follow up question? Go ahead. Okay. Someone needs to steal this bike for me in a minute. Um, see if I can phrase the question. Great. I, I guess, are you allowing us to create sort of a proposal of sorts then about policy to to work with you to create a plan that works for Box Elder County? I, I understand some of your concerns and, and, and this is a terminal basin, which is sort of a, a special animal. Um, I understand that there's a lot of efforts to try and get water to the Great Salt Lake right now. Um, I, I think many of us feel, at least myself, I feel like if if the goal is to get some water to the Great Salt Lake, then there should be a policy that um, matches certain triggers to different levels in the lake or or whatever your concerns are, whatever whatever those particular pieces of, uh, of criteria are. Um, but a terminal basin means that at some point, water is always gonna be open or is always gonna be available or never going to be available. And so, it's kind of tricky, obviously, and I think that we're agreeing on that point. Um, and you can't just push a button. We're allowing applications again and push a button again. Now we're not kind of thing. And so I'm just wondering if there's an, an opportunity here to create a plan. So I think to answer your question, Carl, is we're here to hear comments. And if you want to submit written comments to that effect, We'll, we'll take those into consideration. Had some questions back here. My name's Kelly Lemon. Uh, my wife, Connie, and I live in on the uh, eastern part of unincorporated Box Elder County, known as Collinston. We're on a private well. I'm gonna read my questions because I think it'll make a little bit more sense. I've already submitted this to Will as well today. I think I, what I have to say, uh, there's several people here that feel the same way. My questions and concerns relate to how the governor's proclamation affects prior large groundwater appropriation applications that were submitted prior to the mandate, but are, not, but are neither approved nor denied or were previously approved but not acted on or drilled. In January 2018, the Bear River Water Conservancy District applied for multiple permits to appropriate several thousand acre feet of groundwater in Eastern Box Elder County. And I've listed a lot of those water rights, those application numbers on my submittal here. 
These applications were protested and consequently neither approved nor disapproved. My question is, what is or should be the state's policy regarding these applications if the goal of the moratorium is to protect unappropriated groundwater, then it should probably apply to these applications as well. My second question is related to, but deals with a different status of groundwater appropriation. The Bear River Water Conservancy District has several thousand acre feet of groundwater that has been approved for appropriation that has not been acted on. One example in particular is water right 29-40-20 for 2,500 acre feet. This was submitted in March of 2000. Originally, that was actually submitted in 1998 for 5,000 acre feet, but then it was withdrawn and then resubmitted for 2,500 acre feet. It has since had three segregations with new points of diversion. One well has been drilled to date. That's the Flat Canyon well drilled in 2020, resulting in approximately 150 acre feet. Bear River Water Conservancy District has now applied for another point of diversion well several miles to the north in Collinston. It should be noted that this well is just above several private wells and springs that are the sole water source for numerous homes, as well as supporting irrigation for four farms. The springs are used for, for crop irrigation four months out of the year. During the remaining eight months, that flows to the Bear River, which in turn flows into the Great Salt Lake. Bear River Water Conservancy District has received approval from the state to drill this well under a non-production test well status. Again, if the governor, if the goal of the governor's proclamation is protecting unappropriated water and ultimately the Great Salt Lake, then it should apply here as well. And any further drawing of these large wells should be suspended. One final question is, and again, this is kind of related and I hesitated to bring this up, but it is a question I'd like to know the answer to. Why does the Bear River Water Conservancy District get unlimited time between approval and actual put to use, put to beneficial use? In the noted example above, it has been 23 plus years and currently ongoing. It seems to be an open-ended uh, thing. Thank you. You can take it if you want. I'm happy to address that. You might have to remind me on some of those questions. Um, so the the proclamation doesn't affect any prior filed applications. We can't look back. Um, we have to look forward. Um, simple answer, but a hard um, question, right? Um, so we do have to look forward. What is filed at this point is filed at this point. Um, but that's also why we really need to look at what is the policy going forward, because we really need to understand what is the impact, what do we have pending, and what will that development do. Um, each application that's already filed will be individually reviewed um, based on the best information that we have at the time. Now, I can't get in obviously get into details of any of those specific applications because we have multiple parties. You know, all of you may be here, so all the parties may be present, um, but we still, we have to go through that process with those. On your last question, um, statu there is statutory, um, I guess, um, statutory guidance that if a public water supplier can demonstrate that a water right is needed, for a period of 40 years and they have a 40 year plan, then those extensions do happen. And that is statutorily um, done. So um, happy and I know your house representative is sitting behind you. So good to see you <laughs> out there. Um, anyway, did I get all those questions in a nutshell? So those that are unapproved because they were filed prior to the proclamation, they're still on the books. And so we need to evaluate those individually as we move forward. But what I was trying to say is that we need to look forward. What should the policy be knowing that we have these prior filed applications, right? That are approved and unapproved still. So we need to make sure that we're considering that. But appreciate your questions. Okay. Yes, uh, my name is Boyd Bingham. I'm from Box Elder County. 
And I appreciate you coming here and getting input from the people that are involved. Uh, that's the way good government happens. Um, my question is, we're talking about policy and I'm a big fan of policy because it gives direction. But the problem you have with policy is oversight because in government people come and people go and you can have the best possible policy and it gets kind of shoved to the side and, and it doesn't get paid attention for. Look right behind you. You're talking about something that was put together in 2018 and on the very bottom, it's talking about local water administration practices. The very last line says areas of particular concern include Plymouth and Deweyville. Um, when we're talking about Collingston, Collingston's getting their water from Deweyville. You know, I'm sitting there wondering how did that how did that take place? You're, you're concerned about it, yet it happened. Is there any oversight? Where where is the oversight? Is my question. That's our charge. But you can answer it. I just say thank you for good comments for us to hear. Um, and I know the mic if everyone can hear me. I think this is good feedback for us to receive. Um, you know, when we look at adopting these policies, we do hope that by doing so, it carries into the next administration um, when those of us retire. Um, but we do, that is our charge, like Will said, that we need to be responsible that we are following these policies that have been adopted and make sure that we're doing that. So um, I appreciate that comment. Sure. Oh, I can only take care of myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I get it. I get it. <laughs> okay. Also, to answer your question, these policies that will come out will be written. They'll be posted on our website and, and we have adhered to this policy in 2018. Go ahead, next question. Hi, Brett Jones, city engineer for Brigham City and for Perry City. Uh, just had a question on <clears throat> the way you're gonna handle um, conversion from like irrigation or stock watering to municipal rights. Is that process going to change or anything as part of this? So this is appropriation policy. It's not going to affect change application. Okay. Great. That's all I need to know. Sorry, I grabbed it before it went past me. Um, Commissioner Summers, Box Elder County. Have you guys stopped buying water or stopped buying easements for the Bear River Bay yet down through Box Elder County? And if and if not, why not? That's not our division. That's not our charge. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, as board of water resources. Um, the, In case you didn't know, they're putting a ten foot pipeline from the Bear River Bay up somewhere north of us, and it will go right through the Box Elder County. And they started buying water rights right at the height of the problem. So, if we're not going to extend any of those water rights, then why are we still trying to buy up a place to put the pipe? Again, and second of all, mitigation. Where he's talking about mitigation. We've been in mitigation with air quality here for quite some time. And what I'm afraid of is gonna happen is that you gotta be rich to play. And is this where this policy is going? So if you are able to mitigate or buy other credits from other people in other places and transfer them here. Um, right now we have companies in our area, I'm sure you know of, that buy air credits out of Salt Lake or someplace else and then bring them here so they can continue. Is that where we're headed with water? You're shaking your head no, but I've been in government too damn many years to see that it's usually just a pay to play. And that concerns me with all the farmers and ranchers and everybody else around here that have the water rights. You know, I mean, I, I don't understand how the mitigation, we don't know how to mitigate it, yet we're still gonna put a policy together. Go ahead. Should I just stand here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, those are really good comments. Um, as far as the change application policy that we're talking about, the you you would have to buy a water right um, within that's hydrologically connected. So you couldn't transfer, say, a water right from Salt Lake City up here because that would be like a new appropriation. So um, that is a standard across the state that you have to buy water within that area. You can't transfer, buy and transfer into a new area. So... 
Okay. Got another question over here. Yeah. Um, Deanna Hardy. Um, I was wondering, is the state going to do anything to change their government controlled economic development program? Because as I've been watching this, it came in with uh, John Huntsman Jr. And what it's been doing is picking winners and losers, invited businesses to come to our state. We basically paid them to come to our state. And now we have a water problem. So is the governor going to do anything to stop government controlled economic development programs? Because this is what's causing a lot of our problems. We're inviting people come to come to the second driest state in the nation, in the country. And so now we're having all these issues because we abandoned free market principles and we, we chose fascism. We chose to start picking which businesses we wanted to invite into our state, that some of these businesses use a lot of water, like the NSA and like Brigham City, they, they brought in Niagara. Who, who in the world, if you had any common sense, would bring a water bottling company into your area to buy up your water to sell it out of your community? And it even says in the Utah State Constitution that your municipalities are prohibited from doing any of this. But yet Brigham City went ahead and brought them in, and now they're taking up our water, bottling it, and selling it to other people. So please tell me, is the governor going to do anything to stop the program that never, ever should have happened? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that I can't tell you. Um, that would be up with the governor's office um, to do to change that policy. Um, but I appreciate that you're bringing the comment to this public forum for us to be aware of it. Um, there is one um, in some areas of the state. Um, we are at times um, kind of asked to give input on different businesses that may be coming in. Um, now, we don't know specifically who those are, um, but we do try to at least provide a little bit of a portfolio from a water right perspective um, to help the folks understand the, the areas. But appreciate your comment and, and bringing it so that it can be a record. I don't know where the mic went. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I got a little bit of, I'm a little bit confused about something here. Uh, I got here a little bit late, so, which is my fault, but I didn't hear what all you said to start the meeting, but you, you said something quite ago that's a little bit confusing to me, and that was, you said that if you knew all the applications for water around, you know, it, I, I understood you to say that precipitates for you a, a need to change the policy, tweak the policy or something. Is that correct? Um, so maybe when you walked in, I was answering the question of why are we looking to change the policy? And that is one of the things that we're looking at is what are the pending applications that we do have and even approved that have not been developed. Okay, well then, if that be the case, my confusion is based on this. It seems to me that the amount of water that's out there is what dictates the policy. The policy doesn't get to dictate what water you use. If you got too many applications, for, as an example, for what water is available, then you don't take as many applications. I mean, that's what dictates the deal. And I, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit cynical and skeptical about about this this meeting here, it seems to me that it, it should be your goal, since this is a public input meeting. It should be your goal, your one of your goals before you leave here, find out how all these people feel about this. Because you know, some of us, and I'm one of them, I don't have all day to sit at my computer and type comments to you. My cows out having a calf, and I'm pulling the calf. I'm not, and I get home, and I'm tired, and I'm cold. I'm not going to sit down and I comment to you. For those people who do, that's good for you. But there's people in this room that aren't going to do that. So it seems to me that it ought to be in your interest, and I realize 
that not everybody here has all the information with which to make the decision, but it ought to be your goal before you go home tonight, find out what the majority of the people in this room want based on what they know. Because if you don't, if you don't find that out, then this meeting is pointless. What's the point, point of having a public comment meeting, input meeting, if you're not gonna find out what the people wanna do? And if, they, if the majority of the people here to say, hypothetically, are uncomfortable with this thing, then that should determine what some of your actions are. Because you came here to find out what the people said, and if they tell you, then you gotta listen to what they said. Because the problem is, when you guys retire, and you're gone, there's still gonna be landowners here, irrigating land. You're gonna go away, but there's still gonna be people here after you're gone that's gotta deal with this. So people get cagey about that because it's okay as long as you're here talking about it, but what about when you're not? What about when somebody else comes along and says, well, I don't look at it that way. We're gonna do this. That doesn't fare well for people like us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think before you leave, and I don't know if you're going to, but I think you ought to find out what these people think. Because they're not all going to write you comments. Yeah. And let me address. Um, so one of the things that Will described at the beginning of the meeting is that is exactly why we're here, is to get the public comment. Um, and that's what we're, we're seeking today. So that's why we're here. Uh, my name is Max Hansen. I'm here with my wife, Sheena. Um, I have a question just to follow up on your response to Denise Hardy and the comment she made. You said it was nice knowing what she said and the questions that she raised that you folks are aware of it. But since you're the state engineer, you have the ability to go to Governor Cox and say to him, this is a really good point this lady made here tonight. Governor Cox we think there's some merit to that, and you need to take that into consideration when you're going about making policy on bringing in economic development. Thanks. I'm Kyle Potter. I'm a farmer from the Collinson area. We've discussed Collinson, Deweyville, Area Little. Our family is a water right holder on the Pack Barnard Spring, which is just west of where the Bear River Water Conservancy Districts proposed to drill their well in Collinson. My question is with the new policy, uh, will they have to come up with a plan of mitigation if they affect our spring? That, and that spring irrigates about 100 acres of ground uh four different families for four months out of the year and then eight months that 1.29 cfs spring flows directly into the bear river and into the great salt lake obviously we would like wouldn't like to see the well drilled but if it is will the state help us monitor that spring and would there be mitigation that the bear river water conservancy district would have to come up if they took that water from us thank you yeah, appreciate that comment. I think this is a pending application, right? The so the pending change application. So the specifics we won't be able to get into, um, but there are processes that any application would go through, and then if there is impairment, um, that would be handled through the courts, actually. So, but we need to make sure that we're making the good decisions so that we don't that we protect existing rights. So, if the well goes ahead, would the state be willing to help us monitor the <coughs> spring so we've got a baseline and know if it if it's being effective? I think that we can look at that plan, um, and hopefully the conservancy district um, would step up and and help with that as well. Well, they have offered to. I just assume the state would like. I trust you guys to do that. I guess. Okay. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, any other okay, here? So I'm Tony I Richards. Like I'm I live like in the Beaver Dam area. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just so, no. um, so I just wanted to add a comment. So recently we've been 
you know, as a community concerned, a lot of our wells have dropped in level. Our irrigation out of Willow Creek has declined significantly. So I can't speak for all of area 29, but my, my comment would be, I would like to see at least our area closed out for now because of the trend that we're seeing. It's declining water. I, I irrigate out of Willow Creek and was only able to irrigate a few hours at a time when typically I could irrigate, you know, a whole day without a problem. So I'm, I've seen significant impact to the ability of using the water rights that I have in my area and a lot of neighbors feel the same. Okay. Thank you for letting us know that. My name is Curtis Marble. I own and operate a farm in West Corinne. And I'm curious, is this an isolated incident or not incident, a situation? Or do you plan to do this in other areas of the state of Utah and have these similar meetings as well? Great question. Um, so we this meeting is specific for the um, Bear River Basin, this Fox Elder County. Um, we did just finish up some public meetings. Now they're different situations in each of the basins, but we just had a public meeting in the Goshen area. Um, they're actually exceeding safe yield of the groundwater in that area. Prior to that, we had um, public meetings in North and South Joab County based on studies that we've had, and this is all within the last month. Um, and then we do have other meetings, um, Cache Valley, um, East Shore of Davis County. So we do public meetings like this around the state. And, and why we do the public meeting to receive the comment is to make sure that we're understanding and hearing from the public. Um, if we change a policy or adopt what's called a groundwater management plan, um, that won't happen here, the, the groundwater management plan. Um, but we go through a series of meetings and public's um, comments so that we can make sure that we're understanding the situation. Um, Parowan is another one that we're actively working with, the Parowan Valley, um, Cedar Valley, Burl, Milford. Um, there's several around the state where we do meetings like this. So. Uh, Jeff Hardy, uh, Corinne area. Question I have is on the 10,000 acre feet a year on your old policy. How much of that was allotted out? So I'm going to have Blake. He looked up those numbers for me. Or Will, do you have them? And also, is there is there anywhere we can go and look at anybody that would like to look at who has applied for those shares? Yeah, um, actually, so there are some areas of the state, like above Zion, where um, we do have on our, our web page what those applications are. I don't think we have that for this area, um, but we definitely can make that available. And I, I'm, if I remember right, about 6,000 of the 10 has been applied for. Oh, let me Approved. get the rest. Yeah, so I got the numbers right here. There you go. Really quick. All right. So uh, as far as what has been approved of that 10,000, um, about 2,859 acre feet. And then there are unapproved filings for about another 3,000 acre feet. So that's about 6,000 acre six, feet have been something filed. Something like that been filed for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Buster Marble, I farm in the Bothwell Pocket. Uh, you specifically mentioned the Bothwell Pocket in, in one of your slides and some concerns with the water there. Um, just for some information, uh, this past year we uh, redid uh, two of the wells as far as the piping, uh, the drive shaft bowls and those types of things. And at, the, at that time, we uh, measured the static level of the water and it was actually higher than it was when the well was drilled in 1960. Um, and we can verify that with the well driller. So as far as research is concerned, I would like to know what research has been done in the Bothwell pocket. I know the Conservancy District keeps uh, wonderful records. Uh, we deal with the Conservancy District directly. And then my second question is about uh, priority date as far as my water share. Um, does priority date still take into effect as far as when the well was drilled, if wells start going dry? Um, and then I'm also concerned that the next thing that will happen is instead of 
uh, not allowing any wells to be drilled if the if there's issues elsewhere that then you will um, start taking away uh, some of my water because of issues elsewhere so to answer your questions um, the first question was about the Bothwell pocket we have monitored well levels for uh, in my my tenure over 30 years uh, the no it's not just with the conservancy it is it, it we were monitoring well levels there before there was a conservancy district here uh, the concerns there are water quality based and and there was a UGS study that was done to identify um, those parameters and and so that that has all that has always been a concern the Bothwell pocket area been closed for many years as far as new appropriations for irrigation. Uh, as far as priority, you still have your priority. And so this policy that we're talking about today is just with new appropriation policy and, and has no uh, implication of taking back any water rights, so to speak, or, or forfeiting any or or doing away with any existing water rights. I have a question um, regarding this proclamation. Um, in the in the beginning portion of that letter, it states that this decision was made by Governor Cox at the recommendation of the state engineer. My question is, I would like to know tonight, what were the resources from that? Specifically, what were your top three at least? Namely, who were they? What projects were they? Um, and I may have a follow-up question to that. Sure. Um, so I would say, um, you know, we did have current hydrology to look at. Um, obviously, we had levels of the Great Salt Lake to look at um, that's impacted with this basin. Also looking at what, as, as we started um, really pulling together, what are the pending applications in the area and what impact those may have if they're fully developed or even approved. Um, so it was mainly the records that we have within the state engineer's office based on the water rights and the hydrology that we have. Well, it said that there's been a, a, an extreme amount of money, a considerable amount of money designated to conservation efforts. They are very much attached to this decision that's made. I'm curious to know who were they, what were the groups, what was the science that was, that was gathered? Because there was, surely. Um, and maybe you'll have to explain just a little bit the conservation piece. Um, so there has been legislative money that's appropriated for conservation efforts. Um, that wasn't part of the water rights or the state engineer's decision to do that. And um, I think it's also um, maybe helpful to understand any conservation efforts or or following perhaps that may occur. That's not what we're looking at here today. We're, we're really focusing on the water rights and the water right policy. I have just another question. This is Max Hansen again. I don't mean to monopolize the mic, but um, at one point you said, it's been my understanding that the governor's proclamation in any initiative by your division would not impact well applications that have been approved and that are subject to development. Um, and I'm just wanting to make sure, because you said that I, I may have mistaken or misunderstood you, that you could go back and look at well applications that have not yet been developed or the wells have not been developed. So let me clarify. Um, so the applications that are approved at this point or prior to the proclamation that haven't been developed, those are still approved applications that could be developed. We can't reverse those decisions. So those will still stay on the books. Thank you, just wanted to clarify that. Okay. 
Any other questions? Oh, and then one up here, Shelly. She's getting her steps in. Uh, my name is Trevor Nelson. I'm the general manager of the Bear River Canal Company. Um, first, wanted to thank the state engineer for taking up this issue. This is an issue that we have been um, advocating to be addressed for the last three to five years. Um, we support any policy that for both surface and subsurface water um, results in a safe yield of the resource. Um, we're supportive of a policy that um, particularly our shareholders are supportive of a policy that doesn't require or that doesn't end up in the asking of our shareholders to lease water for downstream uses. Um, we'll be submitting an official written comment and would like to be part of the process of um, re uh, receiving additional feedback if that's desired by the state engineer. But we generally do support the closure of the basin to protect existing water rights. Thanks, Trevor. And let me just um, make a, a follow-up comment to what Trevor said. Um, we want all of you to stay involved in this process and how we're gonna know who you are is that you signed up as you came in. So make sure that you sign that sign up sheet so that we can get out any further notices that we need to send. So please do that. Uh, I'm Derek Wither, the president of Yukon Water Company. Um, Will, I appreciate, I think you referred to a couple public comments that I've previously made in the, in the discussions that we've had in this same room uh, over the last few months. Um, I do wanna make a comment. Uh, obviously, a sm small water company providing culinary water to residents in our county is, is what I do. Um, the saying no appropriations at all, to me, we've gotta have a carve out in the policy for somebody that's 15 miles from a culinary water source or a, a publicly provided water company, it, it makes absolutely no sense to run a one inch line 15 miles to somebody that's that far away from a public water system. So I, obviously, in my opinion, that needs to be put into the policy. I do have a second co comment. So um, you're probably familiar with Tim, Tim Davis is working with the Yukon Water Company on a project right now. The reason I feel the way I do is, is we're on our third well that we're replacing that people are drinking bad groundwater and we're going to serve it with something better than the bear River water conservancy district helps us with so my concern is with no appropriations is we know for a fact that we have people still in this county that are drinking bad groundwater so although this question has been asked in the mitigation for you know how are we going to do mitigation i'm way uncomfortable putting a plan forward with no mitigation policy included in it i think it needs to be, be defined i think the state needs to spend the time through public comment and other resources to try to define that mitigation better than hey we just don't know at this point so in situations where you know there's a potential that we have to go hook up 14 trailer homes in in fielding utah we need a way to help those residents out through mitigation and we can find mitigation, but I think it needs to be defined. Sure. So th this, like I said before, is an appropriation policy. And so translated what that means is for situations like the one you're talking about, a change application can be filed on an existing water right. And so that that doesn't mean you can't do anything in this valley, okay? Is that abundantly clear? And so, so you'll have to deal with existing water rights that already exist in this valley to be able to, to accomplish things. The, the situation you talked about, they had a water right, they have a water right, a change application can be filed on. And so, does that answer your questions? I didn't ask questions. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I asked earlier, I wrote a question of clarification. Tim Munsman, and I'm west of Area 29. But it looks real curious to me looking at Area 29. Everything in 29 is upgrading from the Great Salt Lake. Pretty, and I'm not real sharp, but the motivation here, obvious, is to stop water development in 29 so it runs in the lake. That's from a layman's standpoint. 
Am I not right? <laughs> well, I'm not going to go belabor, but that lake's come up and down for the last thousand years. I was in a meeting a long ago, and the guy pointed out what year it run over 83 and 4 and 5. We was pumping it out the West Desert. Just give us some time, ladies and gentlemen. This crisis will go away, in my opinion. And this spring, it's going to come off them mounds where it is now. And I hope the hell runs off my place soon because I've got enough. But out there, but they could keep stacking it up. But is the governor's proclamation, if I understand right, is put a moratorium on all applications statewide? No, just, just those in, north of the Great Salt just Lake. Just in the Great Salt Lake Basin. Yeah, so, that's what I mean. It, it don't take a wizard to figure out the motivation here, why they're shutting us off up here so we get more water in the lake. So that's Call me in. Yeah, so the Great Salt Lake Basin, um, that also applies to Spanish Fork River, Utah Lake, Provo River, um, Weaver River. So it's the entire basin that the proclamation applies to. Um, this is one piece of that basin. One follow up. Years ago, my, my water users claims for two second feet of water, which is 450 gallons per foot, 900 gallons on my irrigation. When did we change to this acre feet? Confuse me, and why did we do it? <laughs> Confuses a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so a lot of a lot of the historic rights and decrees were based on a cubic feet per second or a second foot. Um, CFS. We, yeah, and then um, the system did evolve to do a irrigation duty or a duty of water that was quantified in acre feet, and that was around the 80s when you really saw um, a lot of the rights being quantified in acre foot. Um, we still um, manage when we have change applications or new applications that come in. We do look and try and quantify it in an acre foot volume, but really for delivery, you have to have a second foot. So there's still, um, I guess, management by both. The one other effort that we do have going on um, is looking at doing an administrative rule to define duty and depletion administration. So that's another project that we're working on as well that hopefully can bring some clarity for that all right one final comment it, richard you're right you know you got to, this is your meeting folks it, get up and go on record about the public comment how you feel about what, what's going on here don't be bashful i'll have to give the mic back to carl if you guys don't start talking <laughs> <laughs> so um if if you are bashful um, which I used to be when I was younger, but um, if you are bashful, you can submit the written comments, and I know it takes away from your day, um, but you can. This isn't, this isn't your only opportunity to give us a public comment, so. Um, um, so Will just asked me about a time frame um, that we would wanna see comments. Um, what I think would be reasonable, um, and maybe you guys can comment on this, is if in 60 or 90 days we come back um, and look at, now I know that puts you more in irrigation season, so that might be a little tricky. We will always have the online option so that at least you can listen in, um, but come back with what the comments are and what we're looking at. So we'll, we'll definitely be back. Yeah, I think she saw you. Okay, Deanna Hardy. I just wanna thank you for allowing us to have public comment. Our county commissioners, Box Elder County Commissioners shut down public comment in 2017. So we haven't had it for five years. And even Brigham City, when I went there, they shut down public comment for those who lived in the unincorporated areas. So they were just targeting me so that I would be quiet. They didn't want to listen to me anymore. So thank you for, for being here and letting us speak. Um, I am afraid, though, that you are letting us speak, but you, like Governor Cox, will continue to ignore us, and he'll go ahead and put in whatever plan he wants. It's just like when I talked with him about the voting by mail problems, I was sitting across from him and he didn't care. He didn't care anything that I had to say. 
and you understand that now because he, he wanted to be the governor someday, so he had to have a corrupt election system. Anyway, um, I don't know how many people know this, but the United Nations has a goal, and their goal is to control all the land, air, water, and people. And Utah is very instrumentally putting this plan in place. You have smart meters on your homes, your water meters, your electricity, and you, get, you see the stack and pack housing that's going around, all the people coming to our state. So it kind of seems like it's part of the plan. Bring as many businesses and people to the second driest state in the nation, and then you have to go in and, and control the water. We have to put in all these water restrictions. So it seems to me that it's part of the plan of the United Nations that Governor Cox is helping to implement. And he is not just him. We have all our other local leaders helping with the process. We go and we ask them, please don't increase our taxes. We go there, we publicly speak. They do it anyway. They just ignore us. They continue to increase the size and cost of government and just they continue just treading on us, making life very difficult. And I really believe this is part of the other plan that they're doing is with the water restriction, because it seems so convenient that this is what is happening. Here we are. And we put the Water Conservancy District in in 1988. We've been 35 years under this program, but I don't know what it does. It just takes our money and forces us to pay for other people's water projects. And also Cache Valley put their Water Conservancy District in just four years ago. So we've been paying for 35 years, and what do we get? We don't get anything. Maybe some, some people get some of the project money, but the rest of us are paying for it. It's just another socialist program, and this is America. We need to stand up for truth and righteousness. We need to turn back to God, and we need to pray to him to please help heal our land because our land is in serious need of being helped. Thank you again. Did you need to comment to that or? <laughs> uh, Jay Cape from Riverside. I just, if you could help me understand the logic of single family dwellings being allowed to have wells and denying culinary systems and others without, I guess, understanding that. Seems like multiple straws in the same pool to me, as opposed to one. And I would just say that that's um, part of this public, why we're coming to this meeting, does it make a difference with the small domestics? Um, most of the, I'd say 80% of the rest of the state is close to all new appropriations. There's very few areas that are still open. So. Sorry, this is Kelly. I mean, again, just to follow up on my previous comment, um, I will keep bringing up that this, is, and I agree that this is, you're just speaking about new appropriations, but this water we're talking about still is this water that's still on the ground. And I think it needs to be addressed as well, where it has even approved applications. And one of the big questions I have is it seems like when they drill a well, they don't get the water they want, then they can do a change application anywhere they want to. And uh, that doesn't seem quite right, especially when it affects people in a totally different area from where that well was, was originally requested. But when they don't get the water they think they're gonna get there, then they go looking elsewhere for it because they've already been approved. I have a real problem with that. And we have a comment um, online. Jed Pugsley asks, is there a definition provided of, quote, small appropriation, close quote, as allowed under the governor's moratorium? If so, what is it? It is defined in statute, um, and I don't have that right in front of me. Will's got it on his notes, and I thought we listed it in the proclamation, actually. Um, so, so 
so 73, so Utah Code 7333. I am not seeing the, that's not the right section, Well, um, Hang on a minute. Isn't it on the slide? Um, here we go. Sorry, the wrong section here. 7335.6, and it defines in there a small domestic as um, one residence, a quarter acre, and 10 livestock. It's a small domestic, but it's in statute there. So you had it, a post it there, but it was on the wrong page. <laughs> okay. Um, nope, I see a hand. If you even move, I'm going to call. I will grab her shoes for these comments. Josh Munns Garland. Is this a government engineered drought? Look at your map. This is Great Salt Lake, everything that flows to it. Let's just go 30 years. For those of you that were in our valley 30 years ago, does that map look different than it does now? You're damn right it does. What's the governor? Is he going to put a moratorium on building subdivisions and parking lots? Because it used to be when the second driest state in the nation got a nice rainstorm, where did that go? Where'd it go? Depends on where you went downstream. We all know it goes downstream. Now, when you build something, you have to retain your own storm water. And if you're engineers, you know how to build a pond. And it is purpose is to hold water. So all this building from Spanish Fort to the Idaho border, from your map says the Thatcher Mountains, but we know clear out west it comes to the Salt Lake and down. Everything that gets built has to hold their own water. Very little goes in the ground, it all goes in the air. So the governments made their own rules to hold the water too, and it just goes away. So there's many reasons why the water's not getting to the lake. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to be here for a little bit. If you have any other questions that you want to ask us individually, feel free or provide us comments. Um, feel free. We will be here. Any last questions? Okay. Um, seriously, um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate those that take the time to come and provide us comment and talk to us and let us know and let us um, understand your concerns. It really does help us to make good policy or better policy or as best policy as we can. So I really do appreciate everybody, even online, that took the time to, to listen to us and give us this feedback. So um, the slide that's up behind my head here is um, where you can submit some written comments. And please do that if you have some time. And come ask us, we'll be here for a few more minutes or a little bit longer. And then we'll come back with um, some of the comments, what we're looking at and further define and try and clarify what we may need to do with this, in this basin. So truly, truly appreciate you coming out. Okay, with that, we'll end. Thank you.